okay and you must also able to name the post that they're going to resume okay you might find uh, from the one of the slides that I've given you in the resources that you got early on the from the from the World Bank right uh, slides from Mama Lejo, although it's, it's a little bit dated, but uh, you can see that uh, World Bank has predicted that some posts or some jobs will be lost and new emerging jobs or posts will be there in future. So we are talking about some new post or job that are multidisciplinary in nature. For example, if we are talking about medical, we talk about a uh, medical marketing officer. I don't know. Uh, we are talking about, for example, other kind of jobs that we never come across nowadays. Okay. So where are you going to get this data? Again, you can get this data from either the from from documents from the World Bank, or you can actually have a look at all these. Um, documents from all the industry or companies related to the program that you're going to offer then what you need to do is you need to also identify what is the trend in the in the career development if somebody graduate from your program so if for example your program will produce uh, this particular talent will there be any future uh, progression in their career and also in their salary. If, for example, you would like to offer a program that there will be very little career progression or salary progression, I think you can start to rethink about wanting to offer such program. Your ITM, eh, for example, I'll give you an example. Your ITM, dia akan um, Bunuh lah, ataupun UITM will kill a program <laughs> or throw a program from the system if the program produce graduate who have low um, initial salary. Uh, UITM sangat particular about tu eh. So, they, uh, UITM menggunakan that factor as one of the factor determining whether the program need to be offered or not or not to be offered. So it is also important when you um, consider whether the program is needed or not to have a look at whether the graduate that you produce will have a career progression or not. Hence, after you have identified those, then you can ask yourself what are the skills that they, they really need and this will um, fit into um, the PEO, okay, and also the program goals that you're going to write, okay. So at the end of this uh, exercise, you should be able to see the actual person that you're going to produce, and this is one of the activities that we have done in Singapore, uh, and my colleagues from Mechanical Engineering <clears throat> have identified what is the career path for mechanical engineer, uh, which accreditation body they have to comply, which company they will work with, and what are the skills that is needed based on all those data, and what is the future trend that they will be uh, going through, right? So only after you uh, identify that person, you have a clear picture, you have to make sure that all lecturers must also share the same pictures that uh, your program will produce. So you have to make sure that that picture can be visualized by everybody uh, in your program. Okay. I think kesilapan kebiasaannya berlaku ialah curriculum committee uh, do not share the program goal or do not even have a picture of the program goal. Um, to be shared with the rest of the lecturers. So normally when I ask lecturer, do you know, uh, or when we ask lecturers, um, do you know what post your uh, graduate will uh, resume when they work? Uh, sometimes um, many lecturers won't be able to tell me what are the posts that 
their, uh, you know, graduates um, uh, resume when, when they actually work. When I ask them uh, which company your uh, graduates will uh, work with, and sometimes um, or many times lecturer won't be able to tell me uh, which company their graduates will work. So this is very, very important and how we how we use uh, this um, so-called industry landscape is that um, like you can see here, this is in Singapore Polytechnic. They actually put this clear picture of who their student going to be on the wall. They even put um, everything that we have produced on the poster on the wall so that their student know that if I take that particular program, this is the person that I'm going to be. I'm going to be working in this environment. Therefore, I'm going to learn this, 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 this and this. So this is this is what also we call um, informal curriculum that will shape your um, student from this state to the state that they will be when when they work okay so it is worthwhile for you to do that and i think in malaysia i've seen that quite a lot of um dulu kita panggil sekolah teknik now we call it kv college vocational have put up a big uh signboard uh, of their industry landscape. I don't know why public university uh, had seldom uh, publish or make a big signage uh, of their industry landscape um, in their premise. Okay, because um, and and also you will, you will realize for marketing purposes, right? For example, like my children, when they go into Jom Masuk You, when they ask the university or when they ask the representative, uh, there, uh, after I, if I take this program, uh, which company will I work with? What will be my salary? Um, and when my daughter asks those questions, they they won't, they will, they were not able to answer such question because I suppose either the program owner or the representative are not aware of all those because it was not this industry landscape poster or activity has not been done. Okay, if it's been done, it, it you imagine eh, bila pergi dekat program masuk, you you just bagi tahu this program is what, 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 then actually orang yang nak ambil program tu, they know that, oh, this is the company that I'm going to work with, or this is going to be the salary that I'm going to get, you know, and these are basically the technology that I'm going to use, and these are the skills that I'm going to have. And they can actually do a bit of reflection, see whether they already have that skill or whether this is a skill that they are willing to develop over the four years uh, period of the uh, academic program. So I think it, this industry landscape is very, very important indeed. And it is a must in Singapore, but it is not a must in Malaysia. But I highly recommend that. But I highly recommend for you to consider coming up with industry landscape. And you can see that. Um, Talent Corp has conducted a survey and it has been found that, you know, uh, many of uh, Malaysian graduates in terms of their readiness, um, they are confident after they graduate and competent, but they have low, low awareness of their profession. You can see that this data actually support the fact that we um, being the the um, committee or academic uh, uh, or the curriculum committee or uh, academician ourselves uh, have made a uh, little emphasis on who they're going to be so maybe because we have not done enough industry landscape or we never come across industry landscape before but i myself for example when i design my subject i always um, do industry landscape before i design a subject why because um, how i what i'm going to train my student in my subject is very much depends on um, the basically the company that they're going to work with or the industry very much depends on what their career path is going to be and is going to be determined by what are the competency and also skills that they are they needed 
without that is very difficult for me to design my subject because I don't know what to to train them for right so I need to have a clear picture of that so after the industry landscape we are ready to state the PEO because we have we already have this picture in front of us this picture in front of us we are ready to write three or four statements and what do you think the three or four statement of PEO that we have to write about this person anybody like to try what will be the three to four statement about PEO actually is a description of this 2034 person. Have you come across the CAP? Cognitive, Affective, Psychomotor. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Okay. If, if, for example, if, for example, if you have, um, for example, I have a daughter who, who reached the age where she's supposed to get married and I can actually ask her if you want to get married uh, can you tell me what kind of guy would you like to get married right and she will say oh I would like to have a guy who are uh, intelligent you see intelligent is related to cognitive but I also like a guy who are uh, not emotional calm content so that is effective domain and perhaps she will also, you know, along the way of the, her description, will talk about, oh, I also like a guy who able to change, uh, you know, uh, a pipe when there is a leakage, right? And that is psychomotor. So roughly, PO is a description of the person that we have identified through industry landscape, okay, about the cognitive affective psychomotor. So that is also the reason why normally people write three statements or four statements. Okay, three statements come from the C, the A, and also the P, right? So it is not really that difficult. Uh, however, okay, there is another way of how we write our C, uh, PEO, and you can see here there are two sets of PEO. Very quickly, um, which set of PEO do you think? better than another. Is it PEO set A or PEO set B? Set A. Set A. Set A. Why do you think PEO set A is better? Because they have this uh, lifelong uh, pursuit of knowledge. Uh, right. I think this is a very important um, attribute. Right. That's that's good. That's good. Uh, it have a lifelong learning attributes. But at the same time, if you look at the actual how the PEO being written, okay, do you notice that set B have words like to produce, to produce, to produce? Remember, PEO is a person that has graduated and work in a discipline for at least three to five years. And this is our program. Four years. This is the IHL. This is the industry. Is it fair for us to write? Okay, the, a, P, uh, a PEO statement where we said to produce when at this stretch of time we are not in control of mm, what's going to happen to this 2034 person right so in terms of write up uh, as well I would like you to note that it is not quite right to write PEO in a form of to produce so and so so okay but we need to write our PEO in a form where we describe the 2034 person uh, where we said that this person that we have identified and state in our program goal is the person who will establish okay or graduate that establish 
as practicing professional in so and so discipline, right? So these are and these are examples of a good way to write your PO and um, statements not to 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 write, right? Um, and when it comes to outcome, okay, remember the um, map on the outcome. Always go back to the map. Once we write the outcome, the next thing that we need to do is to identify how are we going to measure whether the outcome is achieved or not. So similarly with PEO, anything to do with O, outcome, objective, you know, when you come across O, the moment you write the outcome and objective, you can't just leave it like that. You need to, at the same time, find how am I going to measure that outcome or objective. PEO is Program Educational Objective and that is why it is not using outcome. Kenapa tak pakai outcome? Because we cannot guarantee that we can achieve this. Why we cannot guarantee? Because there is a, a, a period of years that that we, we are no longer in control. So we use objective. However, outcome is something that we need to make sure that we achieve. Okay, so when it comes to objective, you can see here, these are basically the assessment. They call, they call it attributes lah dekat sini eh. All these are the assessment that need to be carried out in order to measure whether PO1, PO2, PO3 is achieved. You can see that there are several criteria that they use in order to uh, inform the program owner whether or not the uh, program objective is achieved or not. So you can see here, not only they identify how am I going to find out whether the PO is achieved or not, they also put what we call performance indicator to tell you whether the, uh, the data that they have collected uh, indicate whether the PO is, is achieved or it's, is not achieved. So you can see this is an example. This is a University Malaya example on how PO is written, formulated, and what are the assessment uh, that they use in order to measure whether the PO is actually achieved or not achieved. So you can see uh, engage in engineering related work, uh, attain professional status, are in leadership position. How they collect all this data? They use a survey. Okay, so for your information, the assessment methods for them to collect data on um, criteria A and also criteria B is through survey. So survey is the assessment methods for PEO1. Right, then you go into PEO2, you can see that have undertaken postgraduate study, have undertaken specialist certification, this and that. Okay, some of these are through survey as well. And I think uh, some of the assessment methods in order for them to collect data on all these attributes are either survey or um, or interview, focus group interview. So those are the two common methods used to measure the PO. But you can use other methods as well in order for you to measure the PO, right? But all I'm saying is that at the point when you craft the PO, based on the person that you have identified earlier on through industry landscape, you need to find how am I going to measure that PO? What are the um, so-called criteria and attributes under that criteria need to be used? And you must also identify what are the performance indicator that will tell you whether the PO is achieved or not achieved. Right. Is, it, is it okay at that point? Okay, now after the curriculum committee has published and has um, actually formed this PO where everybody in the program uh, agreed uh, on this PO and also program goal earlier on, then you are ready to write your PLO. PLO is not really that difficult depending 
on your uh, what we call uh, professional body and if you are not governed under professional body you can use the MQF uh, five clusters learning outcome um, in in all you will have 11 learning outcome altogether in in these five clusters then PLO is normally written one to one what I mean by written one to one is that your PLO1 is about knowledge. For example, you, you should say that at the end of this program, students should be able to have what sound knowledge and understanding in, for example, medical imaging. At the end of this program, students should be able to have, for example, strong knowledge and understanding in, for example, the, um, I don't know, the, the dentistry, whatever it is. Right, so normally you attach your program context into this, uh, into each and every one of this uh, MQF learning outcome or into your professional body learning outcome. Okay, some professional body has already have a set of learning outcome that you need to uh, satisfy or fulfill. So once you have written your PO and PLO, you need to then uh, match the PLO to your PEO. Okay, you can see this is actually an excerpt from COPA, COPA 2. Uh, and you will have to fill in table number one at the development stage. Right, so you need to identify PLO 1 is actually supporting which PEO, right? So after you have done that, you are ready to now sequence your subject. Okay, how do you sequence your subject? You need to sequence your subject, which one need to be offered in year one, year two, year three, year four. Um, and not only you have to sequence your subject, you must also um, take care of the uh, requirement from JPT on the program structure. So in all programs uh, that need to get approval from the Ministry of Higher Education must have the component of what we call the uh, courses umum, core courses and also elective courses. So this is uh, liberal uh, courses, general liberal courses and you have core courses and also you have elective courses and you have to make sure that the courses that is under the MPUs will be like within the range of 10 to 20 percent okay and there is a guidebook on how and what subject need to be offered under MPU and then you have the core courses if you have your program standard normally your program standard will tell you what are the core co core courses that you need to incorporate in your program and you can also now consider 25 to 30 percent of your elective courses so you need to fill in uh, this table uh, and you need to sequence all those courses um, in this table such that it will be clear to JPT that you have fulfilled the requirement of uh, core courses, electives and also the um, what we call the, the uh, general uh, liberal uh, education. Right? Rob, Rob, Rob can yeah. I tell you uh, this percentage, uh, the structure, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, this one have to be followed even by the private industry, is it? Yes. Sebab ini majlis pendidikan tinggi ni, MPTN. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so dia bukan JPTUA saja ni. Uh, originally uh, KPT ni sebelum ada KPT kita ada majlis pendidikan tinggi negara. Mm. MPTN. And this has been set by MPTN. Mm. Uh, isu ni MPTN ni sebab sekarang tak ada MPTN. But I, I see a lot of program <laughs> actually um, you know does not follow this percentage uh, mm. and they're okay with it so uh, uh, they've been very strict with this or not um normally uh, okay maybe they they pass the provisional accreditation but when it comes to full accreditation they may get caught mm. they get caught so the best is to follow the structure uh, so that you you will be okay. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, and once once we have uh, uh, followed the uh, requirement from ministry on this structure, uh, we sequence our program our subjects like like that. 
and I think you are all aware we need to actually uh, fill in table three in COPA two, where we need to um, choose subject uh, for the development of the program outcome. Uh, so uh, this step, okay, is this box in OBE, which many people okay, do not so-called understand or embrace its um, uh, function or its intention. Okay, so I'm going to explain what is outcome indicators and performance target uh, now from here. Okay, you can see this is actually a um, four years program. Okay, and in four years program, you can see that uh, there are this. This is an example from the from the previous book, old book. So there are eight learning outcome and QF eight learning outcome. Now we have eleven, but it doesn't matter. You can see how pro, how subjects been sequenced and which subject has been chosen to uh, develop the uh, to develop each PLO. Okay, subject that has been chosen to develop certain PLO is what we call outcome indicators. Okay, so outcome indicators. For example, normally, um, normally we have, when we fill in um, this form, okay, in University of Malaya, you, I think you call it form number two, like so. When we take all this, we need to be aware when we need when we take all this, we need to be aware that we need to take care of that particular PLO and we also need to take care of our subject course learning outcome. So we need to know what that PLO is all about. Okay. Um, and, and when that subject has been assigned to develop that PLO, okay, um, the, the common uh, practice by the by the universities are that they normally take three sub three subject in one uh, particular year okay um, to become the outcome indicator okay so the job of that three subject is is to develop PLO for example PLO1 at the year one level okay and then we pick another three subject for example at year two Okay, to develop PLO at level two. So obviously level one and level two will have an increased complexity, right? Uh, and you pick another three or four subject to become the outcome indicators uh, at level three. Okay, and so on and so on. The purpose for us to uh, choose uh, this subject to become um, outcome indicators is to enable us to make sure that the program outcome will be developed at the end of the program. Okay, so if we look at this example, do you notice that PLO8 in, in, in this document, PLO8 in this document, do you notice that there's only two tick, three tick? Okay, what do you what do you think? Do you think that PLO eight will be successfully developed only by three subject in a program? At year four, in fact, two subject. At year four, you use this subject to evaluate PLO eight. Remember, year four ni, normally is the year when you when you offer subjects and you use those subject to evaluate the program outcome because they are at the exit point of the program. So you can see that PLO8, if I can give you an analogy, is like you wanting a person to be an Olympic swimmer, but the only thing that you do throughout the program of you preparing for, a, for an Olympic swimmer is you're getting your student to the pool get your student to play with the water and then second time you bring your student to the pool you get your student to float and then in the actual competition day you expect your student to perform as an olympic swimmer and win 
So that's what this uh, um, situation uh, actually looked like, okay, with the analogy that I give to you. So this is not a, a good um, curriculum design because um, human being get okay, develop certain attribute progressively. So we need to have a progressive uh, development in nature. And you can see here that we can use this so system called what we call developmental framework. In developmental framework, what we do is that for each PLO, let's say the PLO is on communication, we need to choose, for example, three subjects in year one where we introduce communication. Then in second year, we need to choose another three subject where we emphasize communication. And then in year three, for example, we choose another three subject where we make students use communication skills that they have been introduced and emphasized in year one and year two. And finally, in their final year, in a capstone subject, for example, we evaluate our student communication skills. So that is what developmental framework is all about by right. When we actually fill in, okay, table three, COPA two, we need to have that knowledge in our mind that all these subjects have the purpose to develop the program learning outcome in a progressive manner. And lecturers who are in charge at the lower year of that particular PLO must communicate to those subject lecturer in the higher years on whether or not the PLO at the end of year one has been achieved as intended by the program. Okay. And where do we state the in the, the 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 outcome at the end of year one in relation to P each PLO. That that basically uh, target is what we call performance target, right? Performance target. So every year in a program, okay, by red, there should be a statement of performance targets for each program learning outcome. Okay, and, and if, if let's say this subject that has been um, assigned to develop PLO1 at the end of year one found that from students' results that performance target in relation to PLO1 at the end of year one is not achieved, then this need to be communicated to lecturers who will take care of PLO1 in year two and lecturers in year two, we'll have to come up with an intervention, okay? Or the curriculum committee will have to do something so that when this student go into year two, they are ready to for PLO1 to be developed according to plan so that they can actually uh, achieve uh, the, in, the, the target um, in relation to PLO1 at the end of year two. So, so that is why if you look at the form in uh, table four COPA two, we have to fill in, have you come across transferable skill where you need to fill in transferable skills? And that transferable skills is actually related to which PLO that your subject is uh, in charge of so that the lecturer um, in the next uh, level in the program will, will be able to know that these are the skills that you have developed and you will transfer it to another subject in the program, right? So that is what performance target and outcome indicator is all about. So you can see that this is how developmental framework work. Uh, for example, in developing critical thinking for undergraduate. Uh, and because we are running out of time, I will just keep that explanation. And you can see this is an example of developmental framework in the lab work. 
So year one, normally this is year one, year two, year three, year four. And that is why in year four, we give student project. But I think we, we can all uh, notice that when we give student project, normally our student have not got the skills, cognitive, affective, and also psychomotor skill enough for them to perform the project, final year project, because uh, perhaps uh, develop, developmental from framework was not well taken care of or not implemented in its fullest manner, right? Um, pernah tak kita dapat student eh, bila masuk dia final year project, uh, they don't even know how to identify, um, how to write their, their final year project objective from the problem statement. They, they can't even design your research methodology, for example, because if those skills are not developed in the earlier year, so when you want them to perform those in the final year, they won't be able to perform. So it is very, very important for us to, um, to actually embrace the actual reason why we have to fill in uh, table three, copa two. So it's not about simply ticking those box, but actually have to implement them. So these are basically the uh, explanation behind the the different levels of, of, of lab work. And I think it's quite straightforward. And if you look at communication skill as well, you can see that the um, performance target, okay, get more uh, complex, okay, from year one until year two, year three, and also until year four. So this is when uh, if we are not careful in terms of implementation, you will get lecturers who teach a communication at, in final year will use a much, you know, linear rubric or simpler rubric in comparison to a lecturer who teach communication in year one. This should not be happening if we design our curriculum properly by right. Rubrics for communication in year one should be much simpler and linear in comparison to uh, communication rubrics in for for year four subjects, right? Um, so then we are ready to go into the subject level. So for subject level, we have to uh, refer to uh, table the famous table for COPA. Uh, University Malaya has um, come up with uh, BR003, BR006. Um, and also BR005 to replace uh, this table, but the, the, the content is still the same actually. So here you can see we need to write our course learning outcome, okay? And we have to refer back to table number three, where we need to bring in all our program learning outcome into our subject. So we cannot actually design a subject unless PLO has been stated unless, and unless a curriculum committee has decided on which subject um, has been assigned uh, as a program as a program learning outcome uh, indicator, right? So as far as subject is concerned, this is an example of a constructive alignment. You can see that um, in each subject, constructive alignment is given where is indicated where you choose appropriate assessment method to the learning outcome. So I, I would like to uh, show you that, for example, this is um, the learning outcome that a student should be able to explain uh, something, right? And uh, exam is an assessment method appropriate to measure students' ability to explain. But you can see also here that there is another assessment being used to measure not course learning outcome, but this particular assessment method is used to measure the uh, PLO. In here, this PLO is actually indicated by the uh, MQF learning domain. And if you look at MQF learning domain, there is KKM number three. KKM number three is social skills and responsibility. And that is the reason why is it that uh, the assessment um, is not um, only examination, 
but there, there is another assessment used and this particular assessment is used to measure social skills and responsibility, whereas the exam is used to measure the ability to explain, right? Um, if, for example, you wish not to use two assessment um, uh, because of the CO and the PLO are of different domain, one is cognitive and another one is affective domain, then you can use one strong uh, assessment methods, right? So this is an example of my subject. You can see here that um, uh, it has about similar uh, form like in University of Malaya, BR003. I still use this uh, template because I came up with this template when I was in, in UM. Uh, so you can see here that um, the only problem with the current template is that uh, we, we write our CO, but we do not have the statement of our PLO. So what I did, I modified the template such that I put in the PO that my subject is um, assigned for. And you can see here that uh, I map CO number one to PO number four, and that PO number four is psychomotor P, and my CO is cognitive in nature, right? So you can see that when I have outcome of different domain, one is cognitive and one psychomotor, this is the point when I need to make sure that my assessment will be able to measure the C2 and also the psychomotor P. So in here, you can see that I use assignment one to measure C2 and I use this practical tutorial to measure the psychomotor P, right? So you got to make sure this is what we call constructive alignment. So when you do constructive alignment, it is not only about making sure that your assessment method has the ability to measure your course learning outcome, which is horizontal. But your assessment method must also, okay, able to measure the program learning outcome that has been assigned to your subject. So this is what I call vertical uh, alignment, okay? Vertical constructive alignment. So please remember when you design your subject, you need to make sure that your assessment method must be horizontally aligned and must also be vertically aligned to your program outcome. Okay? This is another example with more detail. You can see here, this is the subject that I'm currently running. Um, and uh, entrepreneurship, you can see that the outcome here is explained. Students should be able to explain. This is cognitive level two, but because this is MPU subject, entrepreneurship is the liberal, uh, uh, general liberal education subject. And the emphasis of the MPU subject is the affective domain. And you can see that uh, uh, my subject has been uh, assigned to develop students' ability to become a lifelong learner. And because of that, I cannot just give exam. Therefore, what I did was I designed a subject such that I use a stronger assessment method. And the stronger assessment method that I choose is that I give student case study worth 50% and the detail of the case study as you can see here I asked student to come up with a individual uh, proposal of who are the um, technopreneur icon that they would like to um, present in their case study and then I asked student to do a group presentation so that they can tell me who is their group icon. And finally, they will have to write a report. You can see here, I have uh, shown um, detailed breakdown, which mark goes to my course learning outcome and which marks actually goes to my program learning outcome uh, on the uh, lifelong learning, on the lifelong learning, right? Um, Umu? Is it the 
Um, since kita dah dah sampai one o'clock, okay. okay. <laughs> Walaupun dah trim pun masih tak dapat, tak sempat lagi. Um, I think the last, the, the only last thing that that I would like to continue a bit um, is the um, SLT. Um, bila, when we design our uh, program or our subject, I think we need to take care of the SLT. If you can give me like another five minutes to 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 get it to get this done, yeah. And you can see here that the SLT is uh, not uh, about you know um, a credit then multiply by forty. By right, how SLT for a subject should be uh, a credit. By right, how a credit. Um, for a subject is determined is that the subject matter expert will have to uh, propose to the uh, to the program owner or to the coordinator these are the topics that i'm going to cover in my subject and after you have chosen the topics you then as a subject matter expert work out how long will you take to actually give lectures give student activities therefore how many how many hours students should 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 prepare for those activities and also for the lectures don't then only after you have done all those calculations then only you will come up with a number that number you divide by 40 that will give you the the credit hours and that credit hour should be given to the program coordinator and program coordinator then will have to decide whether to uh, agree whether to, to approve or not to approve on that subject credit hours. But I think in in in, in most of our uh, institution, each subject has been given credit hours, right? Regardless of of um, how much content that you need to to, to cover. Uh, that uh, create a lot of uh, stress and also a lot of problem in both lecturers and students. Um, why? Because uh, when we do not take care of our SLT, uh, very likely that our student will be overloading. Okay, and I think in University of Malaya, I think you are all aware during the pandemic, uh, students have actually written a good letter to the Ministry of Higher Education complaining about their workload uh, simply because majority of lecturers uh, converting their assessment into so-called authentic assessment and um, there's a lot of miscalculation of student SLT when, when you do that. So all I'm saying in SLT, when you want to fill in, um, when you want to fill in uh, your, your form on the SLT and how SLT relate to your assessment, uh, some people actually ask me how SLT relate to assessment. You can see here, this is, this is my subject, although I disagree to the number of assessment here and, and I feel that assessment need to be less than this. Okay, so that student will not be overloaded because you can, you, because you need to be aware each, each student takes around five subjects. And if five subject and, and if each subject has one, two, three, four, five assessment, okay, we are talking about 25 assessment altogether. And in one semester, student only have 14 weeks before their study week and also final exam. Okay, and majority of students, including my children, during their study, study week, they still have to submit uh, some of their assignment and lecturers still actually uh, conduct, you know, presentation, this and that. So that is so unfair. So all I'm saying is that, like, for example, now I'm at QUT Brisbane, you know, each subject only have like two assignments and that's all to it in one final exam. So, Please consider reducing the number of assessment. There are techniques on how we can reduce number of assessment, and please consider using stronger assessment instead of, um, you know, weaker assessment like tests, like uh, quizzes, and small small assignment worth of ten percent, like like so. Okay, and um, another thing about SLT that I would like to share with you here is the percentage. How does the percentage actually relate to SLT? If, for example, the assignment is only worth 10%. If the subject, for example, is, is three credit, and three credit our subject, uh, if we convert into student learning time, is equal to 120 SLT. SLT. So 10% assignment is only 12 SLT. 12 hours of student learning time. So if we lecture three hours per week, 
then there's only nine hours left. Nine hours left, right? And that nine hours, uh, and, and we can see here from this simple calculation, that 10% assignment must only come from a topic that we deliver for one particular week only, right? So we cannot, for example, design an assessment of worth 10%, but it requires students to use information or content from, for example, uh, three topics that we deliver in three weeks. Because three topics in three weeks, meaning that if, if one week we lecture for, let's say, three hours, Student preparation time is, let's say, one to one. Normally, student preparation hours is actually six, right? So six plus three is actually nine SLT for that particular week uh, content or topic. So all I'm saying is that please review your uh, assessment. Uh, please make sure that assessment is included in the SLT. Right, and the percentage of your assessment must reflect the actual student time to actually do the assessment, to sit for the lecture related to that assessment, to prepare for the lecture related to that assessment. So, in this example that I've given you, you can see here that um, this particular um, I actually give you two examples. One is my assignment number one. Yes, assignment number one is only 10%. Uh, uh, 10%. So 10% is 12 SLT. And 12 SLT is actually coming from uh, student actually, actually do assignment number one, which I estimate they have to take four hours. Okay. So... Where is the other eight hours to make up the 12 SLT just now? They're actually coming from that particular topic, only first topic, which is eight hours over here. So that is what assignment one is all about. Assignment one, 10% come from eight plus four, four SLT hours for assignment number one. And the total is actually 12, and that 12 SLT hours is equal to 10% of assignment number one, like so. Okay, so I'm so sorry that I, I do not actually able to elaborate further. Um, I have cut down quite a lot actually uh, on this particular workshop and still yet not have enough time to explain everything. Um, but before we we end our session, uh, I would like to find out whether there's any question in the chat box. In, in the chat, Umu? Or is there anything that you would like to ask? You have been very quiet. <laughs> I have one question. Uh, for the... Uh, exams, uh, the assignment and all. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's say it carries uh, the quiz, for example, carries 10% mm -hmm. marks. What will be the duration of the quiz? Um, I cannot tell how how much is the duration, but I think for 10%, for you can see that 10% is not a lot of marks. Mm -hmm. um, and 10%, if it's a three credit hour subject, it's a 12 student learning time, right? Mm. So what yeah. you need to do is you need to determine if the quiz come from, let's say, three topics that you deliver in three weeks, okay? You need to roughly find out how many hours already there for the instruction. That is what we call instruction time, right? Therefore, how, how many SLT hours left? for students to actually sit and prepare for the, for the quiz. I normally do it in the reverse manner such that when, whenever that I handle my assessment, I put aside 
the time that I feel required for student to, to prepare and to sit for the assessment first. Mm -hmm. okay. Once I've determined that number, that hours, then only I will adjust the instruction time at the top for that particular uh, topic to be delivered. And I'm sure that the quiz will not actually cover everything in the topic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In, in each of the topic that, that you would like the quiz to 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 include. So that that's what SLT and how it relate to the weighting of the assessment. OK, looking at your example here, yeah, for example, the final exam mm -hmm. is only 40 percent of the total marks. So yeah. uh, would the duration of that exam, yeah, the final exam be like three hours? Uh, Okay, this is this is when we have a little bit of problem because uh, the when it comes to final exam, uh, university ruling has set such that three credit subject must mm. have three hours final exam. So I cannot run away from that uh, spec specification. So that is the reason why I already put aside. This is the time that student need to answer the question in the exam hall. And this is the time that I feel that student need to revise the four topics where the four questions are going to be in the final exam, the six hours. This is my uh, professional estimation on the preparation time. So the total preparation time and actually sitting for the final exam is nine hours, right? And then, because it is 40%, 40% is equivalent to 48 hours or 48 student learning time. And, and you can see that since the exam itself has already taken 9 hours, 48 minus 9 is 37. Mm. Am I right? Around that. Minus 9 is 30. Allah. So what your max? <laughs> 37. 37, no, right? 39. 39. 39. 39. 39. Sorry. 39. So where that 39 coming from? That 39 coming from the instructions related to those four questions. And I know that question number one come from there's there's one question coming from that topic. There's one question coming up from uh, that topic, Shallow Foundation. There's one question coming up from this topic. So when I when I uh, distribute this 39 SLT hours, I distribute that 39 SLT on the topics related to the exam question. That will make up that 40%. Okay, for example, like so this is this is actually question number one related to compaction. I took seven in total seven student learning time for compaction. And then the other question is on the effective stress. I took seven, uh, I, I, I actually designed such that um, I deliver in a three hours lecture and four hours students uh, own learning time, non-guided. And that is how um, the SLT being taken care of in our curriculum design and also planning. But all I'm saying is that we need to make sure that the weightage that we put in our assessment must reflect the hours of student learning for that particular assessment and also for them to sit for that particular assessment. My, my children always complain now, for example, eh, they, they have to, they, they only, they have to sit for final exam worth of 40%. Mm. Uh, but they have to study all the topic from day one. So for them, it's not fair. Mm. Right, because um, if we calculate the SLT for each of the topic in each week, okay, the total SLT 
is more than 40%. Right? Yeah. And yeah. yet, we only give them 40%. So similarly, uh, last time, my my daughter, who's now a teacher, she complained about she had to do presentation. She had to do a lot of work and it's only worth 5%. Hmm. Right, so this is something for us to think about and to ponder. And if we are in a position to control this, and I think this this is this is why I said that we need to uh, relook and reflect on our practice, whether or not our students complain to the ministry about their workload is valid or not. But all I'm saying is that I've seen my stu my students and also my children suffering from subject being over designed simply because perhaps lecturer overlooked at the at how SLT should be taken care of and how we should you know be careful about the assessment weightage and and how we support them um, supporting an instruction is another thing like, that we did not discuss right is there any uh, other question? Yeah, Dr. Aisha, I have another yeah. question. Uh, sure, we, sure. We're getting final exam, uh, major mm -hmm. assignment, let's put it, major assignment. If you don't have final exam, you might have a major, major assignment. And what mm -hmm. you're saying is that, like, okay, if that assessment is 40%, it must be equivalent to the, the task, must be equivalent 40. to that 40%. 40%. But, like, okay. uh, but my question is, like, okay, um, which means that, it's kind of wrong if we do some sort of activity that we don't give marks if it involves quite a lot of work is it you can do activities during the instruction you can see here that i also have some activities during the instruction uh, but that activities does not uh, some activities uh, are used to um, Let's go back to the OBE. OBE system. You can see that assessment is an activity and instruction is not all about lecture. We can deliver the subject through an activity and activity during the instruction may not be graded. They are included during the instruction we can turn the lecture hall into an activity hall, okay? And that is why learning space is very important. We create that activity to support students to be ready for the graded assessment that we use to measure the learning outcome. So that's, that's what it is, actually. Okay, so maybe I'll give you a more, uh, a, a more uh, details about, let's say, an example. Uh -huh. like what I did is, like, in my course, there is, like, a one assignment that's the heaviest is called case study. Mm -hmm. And the student have to write a report on the case study and so on. But in order to help the student understand what is a case study, what are the major things you need to understand about a case study, because many of them, this, uh, even though it's at master level, a lot of students outside from UM, they hardly mm -hmm. do any research. Mm -hmm. So I created an activity called sharing session. Mm -hmm. Sharing session means that like they collected their data, they already, uh, uh, analyze the data and then they share it's a presentation mm -hmm. but it's not graded it's not graded but I will give feedback during that sharing session and everybody will listen like oh okay no this is not too good or uh, this is not clear and so on the whole point mm -hmm. is to help them to refine and improve the final uh, report the assignment when they submit mm -hmm. having said that it's actually kind of heavy also because it's really the case that they're doing. But it's just mm -hmm. that I'm not assessing that sharing, that presentation. Is mm -hmm. that a fair practice? It is a fair practice because what you did in the sharing session is actually what we call a, a formative uh, assessment. Formative assessment is a must and is a requirement in COPA. So you have a good evidence that you actually uh, really support your student through formative assessment. Uh, however, like what you said, sometimes students feel that if it's not graded, then it is not important, right? Um, and um, they, they, they feel that it is not fair and it's overburdened me. So that is, that is why um, in, for example, in this particular subject, um, I, 
use I use this particular assessment where I grade them and at the same time I also use that assessment as formative assessment where they receive feedback from me and also from their peers. And that is also the time when they do what we call evaluative judgment. They evaluate their own work based on uh, my feedback and what they have done at, at that point. So I design uh, the assessment such that I sequence, um, the, the whole thing is, is, is a case study worth of 50% like what you did, but I sequence the, that 50% such that it consists of small parts that are graded, okay? Um, and I also injected the formative assessment in one of the graded assessment. Um, that, okay. that's, that's, that's how I did. Uh, okay, thank you for sharing. But my that I did that once, but I felt that like my quandary at that time, the, the issue I had that the moment I put any grades on anything, yeah. right, it become a pressure point for the students. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I don't really want to add on to that pressure point, and especially towards the end of the semester, which is why towards the, the following semester, I decided, you know, let's just, just no marks for the sharing, just for yeah. the sake of doing the activity. Yeah. But By then, right, of course, yeah. But I think, but I think your, your practice is, is, is great. Um, and I call it true formative assessment because by right, formative assessment should not be coupled or should not be attached together with uh, summative. You can say once it's graded, it is called summative because you have already passed the judgment. There is, there is, but, but here, what I did was I only give them marks for P PO12, but formative assessment that I injected during this presentation session was for them to improve that part. So uh, actually, even yeah. though it's so presentation, I but they're looking at, you're looking at different things. So it's yeah. not that like your expectation is as much as the final product, right? Mm. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, I got a so, point, thanks. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's a, the, the, the uh, basically, that, that is why assessment design in itself is, is, is complex. Um, so when we talk about curriculum, um, design and development, we are not only talking about how do we sequence the subject, how do we sequence our topics, uh, we also need to design and sequence our assessment such that it has the ability to measure the course learning outcome, the program learning outcome, and we need to be very clear of which marks goes to the PLO, to the CLO, and how we sequence them, and when are we going to inject the um, formative assessment, right, in order for them to develop all the graduate attributes, especially those complex ones. And also, I think we need to be uh, aware that when we design our assessment, assessment actually is the main part of the curriculum, that there will be marks for individual and also there will be a group marks. You can see that case study and also another uh, project that they have to do in this particular subject, they are all group work. However, um, each individual will get different mark because in all assessment that I've designed, um, I've designed such that they will get, uh, there are certain components in the assessment that they will get group marks and there will be certain components of, of that assessment that they will get individual mark. So how do I measure individual mark? So I measure individual mark through either reflection or through the interview or through me observing their, their work, progress sheets and their presentation. So that, that's how it is done. Yeah, thank you. Totally yeah. agree because I think this yeah. is a fairer way of judging students because in the past students suffer, those who are good, yeah. they have to carry the weight of the others and mm -hmm. they get A just like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, fully agree with that. But a lot of work on our part, lah. <laughs> mm, at first, at first, but but I think I I I don't know. I I quite enjoyed uh, looking at how much they have developed their graduate attribute and how much that improved their employability. I think I think at the end of the day, um, kenaikan pangkat is one thing, but to see how a person flourish and function uh, in 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 the country is is 
is my my whole my whole philosophy like my whole aim <laughs> right so thank you thank sorry you. i'm dragging the time sorry yeah no problem okay any any more question if not i think i would like to thank adec and everybody for being here today and um uh, and I hope that we, we learn something and I do like to apologize that there's not enough time for us to go into detail into how, especially at the subject level, how do we actually design something like this, right? So thank you so much and all the best, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Right. I'll contact you. All bye -bye. right, no problem, Prof. Yeah. Okay, thank bye. you so much, you guys.